Shalom, shalom. How are you doing, everybody? It's always a pleasure to be able to to come to you. Today, um, really, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to be able to be a thorough blessing. Let us, uh, let's get ready to invite and welcome those who are going to join us shortly so that uh, we are able to, to get started together in a decent and orderly fashion. Good to have you, Valentino, Chad, welcome on board, welcome on board. As usual, we'll give uh, just a very few minutes to be able to have uh, a couple of our colleagues uh, join us on board. Hey, my good sober friend, welcome. Good to see you, sir. Good to see you. And uh, I really hope that everyone has been keeping well. We, we are going through a very interesting time everywhere, whether you're thinking of it economically, you're thinking of it socially, in terms of spirituality. There, there has not been a time like this for very, very long. And therefore, intentional living and intentional thinking through what we do is is very much needed is very much needed this is really not a good time to live your life on autopilot if you're here please start a watch party invite a few friends to join us uh, we'll just give uh, them just a couple of minutes um, and therefore it is uh, it's critical for us to live intentionally um, if you look at what is happening to different countries, um, you, you would be intrigued if in January you had been told that things would be where they are media. And uh, tomorrow, according to um, astronomy, uh, tomorrow is supposed to be the longest day, uh, July, uh, uh, when we're looking at uh, 21st. It's, it's one of the interesting things. Right now, in Geneva, we get to around close to 10 p.m. and the, the day is still bright. Uh, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because it's important to know the time you have and the opportunity it gives you to do stuff that matters. The opportunity that the time at hand gives you to exercise yourself in the things that are critical, in the things that matter. And uh, by way of um, recall, I'm going through a series right now on the kingdom citizen and society. Uh, this may look like it is a bridging between uh, traditional theology and sociology and economics and a few other things. But I told you, you don't do life in a vacuum. You don't do life in a vacuum. Uh, whatever you establish in your home has to come out and be tested in the crucible of daily living. It has to be tested in the crucible of daily living. So if you raise your sons and daughters to be weaklings, they'll get out there and meet the sons and daughters of others who are going to wipe them out. If you build your faith in the vacuum or the overly protected um, environment, uh, a sterile environment, if I would call it that, where the realities of life are not tested against the things that you're teaching, then you will send out a people who are excellent in what you have taught, but they have no idea of how to apply it in day-to-day -day living when they reach into environments where there are crises, where there are challenges, where there's discord, where there's contention, then you find that because in their reservoir of knowledge that they drew from your environment, they will not have what it takes to deal with the enemy at hand or the challenge at hand. So they will lapse back to what they saw on TV, what they heard on radio, what they had when they were out with the boys or the girls, uh, the stuff that they instinctively draw from having watched their parents deal with marital conflict, so if the father walked out, when he finds he has no more scriptural argument and he doesn't know what to do with this, born again and everything, he's going to storm out of that house. 
And you, if you're not careful, you're going to have grandchildren who have no father or, or no mother or who come out of a broken family. So this is not theory we are dealing with. It's important to prepare your life in a way that it can measure up in the crucible of daily living. Uh, let's get started in an orderly fashion, if you would uh, allow me with a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We bless you for everyone that's joining us and has already joined us today as we go into discussing and learning about the kingdom citizen and society. Father, I pray that you will give grace to everybody that hears, make the word relevant and applicable, and I pray that your people are going to walk out of this time with some, something that they can use to be a testimony and a blessing in their day-to-day -day living. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, a quick recap of where we are um, last time. I think I will uh, begin with giving us the reference scriptures that we are going through currently. And um, for one is uh, First Chronicles chapter 12. First Chronicles chapter 12 and uh, verse 32, reading from the Kingdom Constitution. This is the New Living Translation. It says, from the tribe of Issachar, there were 200 leaders of the tribe with their relatives. All these men understood the signs of the times and knew the best cause for Israel to take. Another translation says, and the men of Issachar knew the times and what Israel ought to do. So they, they didn't just understand the times, but they understood the implication of the times that they had deduced from the wisdom that they had. Because knowing the time is not sufficient. You must know the time, and as a derivative of knowing the time, you must know what adjustments you need to make. You must know, for example, when you go to work, when it reaches the evening, it's time to log off. It's time to knock off, as our friends uh, in Zimbabwe and Zambia say. When it's time to knock off, then you need to know that is when you have a transition from your work mindset to your home mindset. If you have trouble at work and you don't effect the transition, you will carry the trouble into your home environment and put people under pressure who had no issue against you, who love you, who care about you. Understanding the times teaches you whether you are correctly equipped for the season ahead of you, the season at hand, and whether you need to grow and change in certain directions, and what you need to initiate as a minister, as a husband, as a father, as a CEO, as an employee, whatever it is you find yourself doing. You are in the kingdom, you are interacting with the kingdom, you need to know both the times and what Israel ought to do. Uh, during that time. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 40 is the foundational scripture for this entire series. And it says, let everything be done decently and in order. Let everything be done decently and in order. So we want to start laying the foundations of how to conduct yourself in society as a born again, as a, a kingdom citizen, as a man or woman of God. As an individual who believes that Jesus Christ is who he, he says and who he said he was. So we started after some initial foundations, uh, the first series, the first uh, sessions in this. I started last, last time, that was a fortnight ago, talking to you about the kingdom citizens truths, certain truths that we needed to recapture. So I talked about ensuring that the divide is not between the spiritual and the secular and that according to the constitution of the kingdom the actual divide is between the sanctified and the profane between the sanctified and the profane and i reminded you that there wouldn't have been incidences of profane fire in the temple if everything that happened in a temple was automatically sanctified so just being in the temple should not hoodwink you that what you are doing or what you are engaged in or your life is sanctified because you are in church. You can't be in church, but you could be allowing profanity to really 
color your life, to be the hallmark of how you're conducting yourself. So denominations won't bail you out of this. Uh, you know, your proclamations won't bail you out of this. Your life has to reflect a certain level of sanctification. We talked about um, the importance of learning the dynamics between of dual citizenship. I talked to you about the statement that believing is not sufficient. Belief is not sufficient. You must go beyond belief into a place of conviction and into a place of conversion. I reminded you that scripture says that even, even demons believe and tremble. So that you believe that you have mental acknowledgement and acquiescence. You agree that scripture is true. You agree that you need to pray. That is not sufficient. You must then get convicted where you are at a personal level. You are assured that these truths demand your individual response. And then you get to a point of conversion where there is a process of transformation and change that happens in your life, characterized by a series of decisions. So belief is not enough until it affects your decision making. And then I started on the series, uh, the area of the hazard of the second hand approach. Second hand approach, and I dealt about the second hand encounter and why Israel paid a very high price for refusing to listen to God in Mount Sinai and saying, Moses, you go up the hill. We are going to stay down at the foot of the hill. Come back and give us a second hand version of what God said. Therefore, Moses ended up knowing the ways of God, but they ended up seeing the works of God. And the works of God did not prevent them from dying in the wilderness. And I, I told you as I was closing that just seeing the miraculous of God will not guarantee that you will finish your journey in an orderly fashion. Because there are many who have seen miracles and didn't finish well. The ways of the Lord are different from the works of the king. And you have to understand how to go about them. Today, I start with the second part of um, uh, bullet five, and that is the second hand revelation. The second hand revelation is when, as a consequence of the second hand encounter, you end up hearing things that the individual sharing with you got them interacted with that truth, interacted with that principle, was allowed to understand very, very clearly, and therefore that truth sunk into their spirit. They were able then to transform it into a truth they have handled. They were able then to bring it forth and speak about it as a revelation. They had seen it, they had understood it, and the truth that they grasped was then able to transform their lives. You cannot be transformed by a truth that you have not handled personally. And the danger with second-hand revelation is that when you understand the way it is articulated, sometimes you are hoodwink to think that you have understood what that revelation is. Sometimes you hear a man of God get up and say, God is my father. And you, you say, yeah, yeah, it's in scripture. I believe it. And you repeat it. You repeat it because you heard it said, but you don't understand the implications of saying God is your father. Because unless you get a revelation at a personal level of what fatherhood means, that calling him Abba, Abba the Hebrew word for father is source, that you understand that every other thing could be a means, but he is the source. You understand that your job is a means. You understand that your friends are a means of encouragement. You understand that ministers are a means of delivering grace to you. But everything doesn't come from any single means. It comes from the source. That would cultivate a way and a lifestyle of gratitude to God. Even when men are good to you. Even when women are a blessing to you. When you walk around and you find faithful friends who stick with you through hard times. You don't shift your focus from your source into the means. You thank God for the means being there and saying, I'm so glad to have men who never quit on me. When the days were hard, when I was completely out, when I had lost my mind, when I had sinned and gone crazy, I, I didn't know what was going on. They stuck with me. 
they would call me. They, they stopped preaching to me at that season because I was not in a disposition to be preached to, but they just kept on loving me. They kept on honoring me. They talked to me like I was a man, not like I was uh, something, you know, discarded. Like I mattered, that I was important. They, they could connect with me on a religious or spiritual level, but they still kept the bond, the friendship, the honor, you know, the camaraderie. They, they were there for me. When you recall those things, when you sit down and reflect, then you must realize that it was God using them to tell you that I will never leave you nor forsake you. That it was God speaking to you and telling you that even though you quit my house and you went out and you're eating with pigs and you, you, you couldn't find even that which you would have fed and you remember servants in your father's house were doing better than you. But when you picked your phone and you called the other servants in the house, they picked your, your call. They still talked to you. They still loved on you. They went out for dinner with you. They knew that you were angry against God, against church, against the pastor. You, you were tearing down preachers. You were coming after them. But when you reached out, they were still there. That was God telling you, I still got you. I'm st I still love you. I still care about you. I have not quit on you. You must be able to realize that there is a difference between the source and the means. If you don't have a personal revelation, you get clouded between means and the source. You get clouded between ways and works. And when you fall in love with works, then you will be in the peril of the enemy sneaking in and doing similar works for you without following the ways of God. And without realizing, you will be drawn away from the kingdom and still benefit from the works because your appetite had shifted to the works. When you don't have a personal revelation and your second-hand revelation is that healing is our right. You don't understand why healing is your right. You don't understand how to access healing. Then anyone with a spirit of divination can come and heal you. And you will walk away feeling and declaring that I am healed, therefore I'm okay. No, no, no. Not everything that seems to be miraculous is automatically of God. You must grow up to the point, especially in the day we are living in. Oh, all you have to do is turn on some of cable TV. Magicians are now a mainstream feature in modern secular TV. They are a mainstream feature. And they, they do all kinds of fancy things. The other day I saw one of them walking on water. <laughs> a magician on TV walked on water. And that's enough to pull out some of your shallow roots if you're not clear. Because if you don't understand that the coming of the wicked one will be with the working of many counterfeit signs and wonders, then you will just be impressed by the fact that a magician did something that somebody was able to deliver some kind of result. Results are critical, but you must have these results delivered in the context and in the environment of the kingdom and the principles of the kingdom. Therefore, the truth is actually the umpire of everything that happens, not just results. An understanding, a personal revelation, a personal first-hand revelation is critical for you for safety in the journey in the day we are living in. I'm telling you, when you have had time before the king and you have had a personal encounter of him shedding his love abroad in your spirit, when somebody tells you with an excellent argument that God doesn't care, that is why there is a pandemic, that's why there are floods, it's too late. You have experienced it personally. It's too late because you were there when the Lord spoke to you when the scripture was unpacked to you, when you got an answer to prayer, it's too late for a clever argument to sway you out of your foundations. You are only certain and grounded because you had a personal experience. So the first thing is you must avoid the second-hand encounter. Second thing, you must avoid the second-hand revelation. And the third thing in this little trilogy is that you must avoid second-hand worldviews. A worldview is basically a lens, a set of lens 
that is defined by perspectives, by opinions, by beliefs, by attitudes, in, through which you interpret the world. If you interpret the world that um, everybody is a liar, then it doesn't matter who comes to you with what statement. You have already applied a filter that every man is a liar, for example. So if you're single, even when you're complimented by a man, that's a lie. If a man comes and gives you a good report about your business, then you ask yourself, what is it that they want? You know, what are they up to? What motive is driving them? Because you have filtered the entirety of life through the lens that every man is a liar. And the problem with most of these worldviews is that we acquire them without realizing. If you are around critical people, around bitter people, around racist people, around ethnic people, around tribal people, around corrupt individuals, then you develop a filter that takes you through life that when someone tells you that hard work pays, you say amen, but back at the back of your mind you're laughing and you say you know, tell us the truth. What did you really do? What did you really do? How did you get to where you got there? What deals did you cut? You know, what, what ways did you make crooked? And you, how did you manage to hide it and keep it in the down low? So you have a filter in your mind that everything is perverse, that everything is a lie, that everything is wicked, that everything is, uh, you know, every man of God is trying to take advantage of you. That every woman is mischievous and a liar, you know. And these things then limit your ability to become a kingdom citizen that is a blessing in this day that we are living in. Because when men and women come across and they sense around you that there is a layer of pessimism, that there is a certain way that you approach life that is not legit, it's not real, it is tainted by your own biases then I'm, I'm telling you for sure, my brother, my sister, man of God, woman of God, you will lose them, not because you can't preach, not because you don't have an anointing, but because their personal experience with you shows a worldview that cannot be supported by scripture. You can preach well, but when it comes to your personal worldview, when they discover that you have biases that cannot stand scriptural scrutiny, then there's a problem that you're going to have to deal with. When they discover that you are a racist, that when they discover that you are a schemer, when they discover that you are an undue, you have undue biases against men or women, against one group or the other, then you find that you lose your grip and your authority and your ability to be a minister and a blessing to those that God has sent you. So you need to be very careful about that. And, uh, these, these attitudes, uh, the views that we have, sometimes they affect our ability to develop divine networks and partnerships. Because you develop views based on what others tell you about nations, about people, about churches, about denominations, about leaders, about ministries, about organizations. The list goes on and on. Have you ever had somebody who didn't like you because of what they had about you? Have you ever had people who despised you, not because they met you and interacted with you, but because somebody gave them a story about you? And you realize the minute you meet them, you have the uphill task of proving yourself, even before you have established level ground between you guys, you and them, in terms of your relationship. They ask you to prove yourself because they have branded you. This second-hand worldview has limited congregations from becoming one in the body. I remember an old song that sang, and uh, the singer said, We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And together we'll tell the world that God is in our midst. And they'll know that we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know that we are Christians by our love. 
You are unable to demonstrate the unity in the spirit when you allow yourself to be contaminated by attitudes because of what you heard about a minister, what you heard about a man, what you heard about a woman, what you heard about a neighborhood. They asked, can anything good come out of Nazareth? There was a branding about the entirety of Nazareth that made the general Israeli despise anything that would come out of Nazareth. And look at God. He picks to have Jesus be associated with Nazareth. He says, Jesus of Nazareth. That Nazareth where everyone said nothing good could come out of it. It required men and women who could overcome that hurdle of the mindset that nothing good could come out of Nazareth to be able to connect with him and walk with the Messiah during his uh, earthly ministry. All the others had to take a back position because of the attitude they had. Amen. So that was under number five, the hazard of the second hand approach. And I'm sure God would be able to show you and train you and teach you more on what you need to understand. Uh, Pastors uh, Justice Maweu, uh, welcome to have you. Winnie, God bless you. Pastor Javier Menendez from uh, Chile, God bless you. We love your country. We love your wonderful people. God bless you so much. Number six, the tendency to trade freedom for convenience. The scripture says, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, the society we have lived in, with the good intention of making the human experience better, has strived through innovation, through research, through discovery, to ensure that you don't have to wait 10 minutes to have your food ready. With the microwave, bam, two minutes, your food is warm, you're ready to eat it. That you don't have to get into a boat for four months before you move from Europe into the Americas, whether it's north or south. You get into a plane, eight hours. You are in East Coast, nine hours. You're in the central, uh, the central, the, the Midwest, sometimes even eight, nine, ten hours. You are right in the West Coast of the U.S. You are flown. You are in Brazil. You have gone into Indonesia. Jet travel has made it easier to get there and the patience that would be needed for you to undertake such a journey has, has diminished in value. And we, we, I am not beating, I am not knocking down the importance of innovation to bring solutions to the human experience. We must be able to try and dominate the earth and make life worth living make life easier for the day that we are living. However, in scriptural principles, the principles of scripture cannot be broken and they cannot evolve based on the century we are living in. Scripture says, run your race with patience. Scripture says, those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Having faith alone is not enough. According to that scripture in Hebrews, it says you need faith and patience, faith and patience. So for you to be uh, a heir of the promises, not in the spiritual realm only, but in your day-to-day -day living, being able to see the healing of God come into your life, being able to see the prosperity of God ma uh, manifesting in your life, being able to see the peace of God manifesting in your life, being able to see the joy of God coming through, then you must be willing to put in the work, stay the course, and allow God in his season to bring the increase and the harvest that you need. Otherwise, the enemy can give you a fake harvest and it cannot last and it cannot be a blessing. The enemy can give you an increase in material that brings sorrow with it, that brings shame with it, that causes your name to be in a bad shape by the time your children inherit it when they are called, you are the sons of Ahab, so to speak, then it becomes a shame, a badge of shame to your, your lineage because you did not have the patience that was needed for you to allow God to do what only he could do. And in this particular time, what I want to uh, speak to us about in the kingdom citizen in the 21st century society, you must be careful of the trap and the temptation to trade freedom for convenience. 
to trade freedom for convenience. Remember, Scripture says that him whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And there are different aspects according to Scripture that contribute to the freedom of a child of God, contribute to the freedom of a kingdom citizen. I'll give you seven of them very quickly. That you can't find yourself in bondage the day you give your life to Christ, you come into the kingdom. There is a pathway that is defined. And this is not in chronological order, but these are very important. How, what are the ingredients for accessing and retaining kingdom freedom? And one is faith. Anything that you do that tends to give you a result, it is not born of faith. You don't have scripture behind it. You have to be very cautious. Whether you are running in the flesh, you are running in human philosophy, or you are actually executing the, uh, the kind of conduct and pursuit that is based on scriptural truth and scriptural promises. You have to ensure that you not only have faith, but your faith is based on number two, knowledge. Knowledge according to scripture. That is why you need to find, you need to locate a man or woman of God who will teach you the word. You have to spend time, whether you're getting online with podcasts, with, uh, with CDs, with uh, MP3s, whatever it is, it is read a book, buy the books, buy, get yourself a proper library as a child of the kingdom in this day we are living. The anointing is not enough. Your zeal is not enough. Your passion is not enough. You need knowledge. You need knowledge. You need knowledge, friends. The third thing, you need wisdom. You need wisdom for you to live a balanced life that will guarantee that you are not baited by shortcuts and traps that then lead you back into bondage and limit your liberty in, in the Lord Jesus. Number four is discipline and hard work. Faith is not a shortcut or an excuse for indiscipline. Believing God is not a pass from hard work and diligent. The Bible says, seest thou a man diligent in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before mere men. Scripture says, wealth gathered by labor increases, but that which is gathered by craftiness and wickedness dissipates. So there is a value of hard work. He says, by hard work, by the strength of an ox, there is increase. By the strength of an ox, there is increase. So, for you to maintain your liberty, you must make sure that you develop a healthy kingdom uh, attitude of despising freebies. The things which are free, you must develop an attitude where it's okay to be blessed, but when things seem to be just falling on your lap for no clear reason, you must be able to have the kind of clarity of mind to hold back and ask, why do I deserve this thing that has come my way? What, what is this linked to? Is there a price behind me taking this? Do I become beholden to a certain group by accepting this? Do I compromise my values and my associations by accepting this? Is this going to be the kind of thing that made Abraham so careful? that when he was asked to take the tomb for free as a burial place, he said, no, 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 I will pay the full price, lest you say, <clears throat> you know, uh, they said, what is this between friends? He said, no, 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 but I will pay you the full price. I will pay you the full price. The same Abraham, when he had gone after the five kings, and he had, when, he, uh, when he came back, he, he had so much available and he decided to go forth and tithe, acknowledging that God is actually his source. It is not spoils of war that are his source. When David went out fighting so that he could recover his children, his wives, and those of the, the, people, of, uh, the people that were with him, when he conquered, he said, I will not take anything extra except for my men. Lest you say that you are the ones who made us wealthy. He was careful about living in a way that takes the credibility away from what God was doing in his life and giving it to men 
who are very mercurial, who are unreliable. Today they, they are with you, tomorrow they have changed and they are slandering you. Man of God, woman of God, listen to me. Be able to be an individual that doesn't shy away from working hard. Whether it is working hard as a lay minister, working hard as a full-time minister, even you who is in the marketplace, don't be ashamed to roll up your sleeves and go into laboring. Discipline and hard work are part of the things that ensure kingdom freedom. That you can sleep at night without wondering who is coming after you. It's critical. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome. Welcome on board, Tom Edward. God bless you so much. Uh, number five is character. And living a life of order. Character and living a life of order. When, when you live a disorderly life, I assure you it is a function of time before your liberties are taken away from you. It doesn't matter how convenient it looks currently. You allow a life where your morals drop, where your standards drop, where you, you allow disorder to fester in one or another area of your life before long in those specific areas or other areas you will find that you are started living a life that is unscriptural because scripture says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free so the man or woman that belongs in the kingdom in the 21st century must develop a healthy jealousy of protecting the liberty that they received in Christ they must be vigilant in that way so that when the enemy comes seeking whom to devour, they may not be in a state where the enemy can devour them, can destroy them, can bring down their family, can bring down their business, can bring down their reputation, can bring down their, their, their ministry. Now, of course, the enemy occasionally tries to take you down, even when you're doing the best. Well, what I can tell you for sure is that even if a righteous man falls seven times, he will arise again. That is not the kind of thing I'm talking about, where the enemy has legal ground to take you down. So it's very, very important for you as a kingdom citizen to be able to be grounded sufficiently for you to have character and order, bulwarking and supporting and preserving your liberty. Number six, under the ingredients of freedom in the day that we are living in, in the kingdom, is the anointing of God. Now, sometimes people trivialize the anointing. But the scripture is very clear. It says the anointing breaks the yoke. The yoke is actually a form of bondage. It's a form of limitation. And let me tell you, there are certain things that you cannot use wisdom to escape. There are certain powers that come against you and your life and your family that a good dose of wisdom is not sufficient. A good dose of character and good intention cannot do it. There must be divine enablement that comes upon you because when the enemy uses power and authority that is against your natural ability to deal with, you have to tap into something bigger than you, stronger than you, wiser than you, to deal with that which is holding you back. Sometimes I tell you, friends, the enemy can come with a spirit of heaviness and lead you into a place of depression, into a place of evil foreboding. What is evil foreboding? Evil foreboding is a state where there isn't one thing you can pin on, but you have this continued sense that something is going to go wrong in your life. You have a perpetual fear that if something is not wrong today, it will go wrong tomorrow. That this relationship, that there is so much fun and joy in it, but you're looking at it because you believe something is going to go wrong. So this joy is going to be short-lived. This peace is going to be short-lived. This prosperity is going to be short-lived. And this anticipation of wrong things, of a bad time, of an evil experience, of something negative happening to you, sometimes it becomes so entrenched in you because of the blows that life has dealt you, 
because of the valley of the shadow of death that you have walked through. You have had parents die of cancer. You have had job losses and move from financial stability to your children being out of school, to you being unable to feed your children. And, and you looking at it, you're trying to reach friends uh, to bail you out. And at that time, they are also dealing with their own drama and they are unable to help you. And you remember that experience and how long it stretched. And you just believe that everything positive is always going to be overtaken by something negative. Well, let me tell you, friends, Scripture says that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Joy comes in the morning. Sometimes for that joy to come in the morning, it's not just a function of time. There has to be a power that brings liberty and freedom from the shackles that kept you in your nighttime. There has to be an anointing sometimes. You have to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to become resident in you. You may say, I don't understand. That's okay. That's why you need to learn. That's why you need to get a church that can teach you that. That's why you need to connect with a man or woman of God who can explain to you what the anointing is, why scripture says the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing breaks the yoke. Scripture says, when they are sick among you, anoint them with oil and they shall be healed. It's amazing what the anointing can do. And many times when we are learning about wisdom and knowledge and the place of character, sometimes we unwittingly belittle the importance of the anointing. Jesus Christ, our own model, he couldn't start his ministry until the anointing of the spirit came upon him. And yet he himself was a son, the son of God. And yet he needed the anointing for his earthly ministry to take off. My brother, my sister, listen to me. You want to maintain your liberty? You need the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You need that anointing in your life in one way or another. Don't, don't belittle it. I don't know the theology you have listened to, but listen to the scripture. What does the scripture say? I can do all things through Christ which strengthen, strengthens me. What is, what is the meaning of the word Christ? It's the anointed one and his anointing. You need the anointing to, sus to sustain your stamina during battles, during hard times, during difficult challenges. Thank you, Dr. Sunil. It's a pleasure to have you on board. Man of God from India. Uh, we thank God for what you're doing. Uh, in your marketplace ministry with a hospital, we always pray for it. Such a honor to have you, sir. Such a honor to have you. And uh, the last thing that I would just mention in terms of the ingredients for accessing and retaining your freedom in the kingdom is the place of vision. If you don't believe that there is a brighter tomorrow, if you don't believe that the promises of God are yea and amen in your life through Christ Jesus, then it doesn't matter how much somebody tries to encourage you. You will allow the darkness and the difficulty of the day to become the prophet of your tomorrow. You must believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you could ever ask or think according to the power that works in you. You must believe according to scripture that the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter unto the perfect day that there is an increase in light in the experience that you are ordained to have as a believer in Jesus Christ. You must believe that God is working for you, that God is working for you, that he is fighting for you, that he has not left you alone, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that even though you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil. For his rod and his staff, they comfort you. That he will lead you into green pastures. You can't tell that the pastures are green if you're in the thick, the thick of a dark valley. Everything looks black. There may be green pastures, but you can't see it when you're going through a difficult season. You must allow the word of God to create a heavenly vision inside of you. To create a kingdom vision inside of you. A vision is not necessarily only that which you get when you're sleeping in the nighttime. 
and something eschatological or transcendental comes your way. No, no, no. Sometimes it is God painting a picture of a better tomorrow by the truths that are in the world. For you to have the strength to believe God, to pray, to stand, to persevere, to endure during your difficult seasons, you must locate certain truths in the word of God that you say, Father, lead me to that place. Lead me to the place where I can indeed say that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that is the kingdom of God. I have righteousness, but I have no joy and I have no peace. There are so many wars I'm fighting. There are so many difficulties. I am at work and I may be the only believer and I don't have authority. I have men and women over and under me who despise my faith, who mock my belief. And the mockery is tolerated in the institution. And therefore, I have no peace. Listen, you must then have faith that when God says righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that is the kingdom of God, you must believe that God can give you peace beyond those circumstances. When you then go and find a scripture which says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, do I give unto you. Then you realize that you can have peace in the middle of contention. You can have peace in the middle of mockery. You can have peace in the middle of a pandemic. You can have peace in the middle of financial difficulty. You can have peace in the middle of marital strife when the enemy has attacked your family. You can have peace and know that God is fighting for me. God is working things out for me. If only I remain in faith, if I only remain believing. But if you allow convenience to overshadow the importance of freedom, then anytime there is a fight, because you so desire peace, you will allow the enemy to take your blessings away, to take your promises away, to take your family away. And you will be so quick to run into divorce. You will be so quick to quit that job. You will be so quick to leave that church. Just because there was a misunderstanding with a pastor and he told you something you didn't like or he didn't see you waving at him and you say, pastor has an attitude. Scripture says in the book of Ecclesiastes, when the spirit of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post. It doesn't matter what happens. If the attitude of the leader seems to have changed, you need to stick with the assignment, with the positioning that God has given you. Don't just waver because there is a wind that is contrary. And in this particular day that we are living in, in the 21st century, where we are just in the middle of a major attack on the kingdom, the kingdom of God is suffering violence, you must see four conveniences that we are going to be increasingly invited to take in the place of the liberty that the kingdom guarantees us. One, is the convenience of security. The illusion of predictability. Friends, let me tell you, even those days of job security are gone. You who are in the marketplace, things shift so fast. The other day, in my home country, I read that there was a discussion to start taxing the benefits of retirees. They worked their entire life. Their expectation was according to one legal dispensation. They retired. They had put in their bid. They are now supposed to be enjoying the returns of a lifestyle, a lifetime of hard work. Midstream through that, all it takes is one change in the legal dispensation and position. And if they were getting $1,000 a month, they are down to 700 That which they had anticipated has shifted. This is a day and a season of continued shifts. There are shifts in the economic sphere. There are shifts in the religious sphere. There are shifts in the, the philosophies regarding family. There is, a, there is a fight going on. And if you think that you are just going to be secure and, and rest on your laurels about what you believe family is, not willing to fight for it, not willing to be misunderstood, to take a stand, for the family that you have. Another time, my dear brother, you'll come back home and find that your wife has a wife. 
You will come back home, my sister, and find that your husband has a husband. Because you didn't contend for your family. God forbid. You cannot rest on your laurels and assume that you have security on the things that God has already granted you. You must have a vigilance. You must have the attitude of a watchman continually standing on the walls of Jerusalem, watching continuously. You can't be a man or woman who goes to sleep. A little sleep, a little slumber. It's not only poverty that will come regarding your finances, but you can have a poverty in every kind of realm in your life where you have become lazy and complacent and overly secure. Gideon, when he was faced with an army, God told him, take these men, the, the soldiers, take them to drink water. Those who laid everything down because it was a time for refreshing and they just buried their face in the water and drank, he told them, he told uh, Gideon, send those ones home. Those ones don't have an ability to watch as they're getting refreshed. But those who lapped the water, scooped it in their hands and lapped it like a dog so they could keep an eye on what was going on. These are the kind of people who were needed in Gideon's 300. There is a sense of false security that as kingdom citizens in the day we live in, we must be able to shake it off. And even when our nations look stable, we must contend for our nations. Even when our companies look stable, we must contend for our companies. Not only in prayer, but in study, but in hard work, but in raising men and women. The next group of leaders, raising disciples if you're in ministry. You, do, you can't just go through ministry being an excellent preacher and having a crowd around you. But no one catching your spiritual DNA. No one getting your values. No one understanding why you do things the way you do them the decisions that you make, why you value decency and order in the way you conduct things, why you, you honor the importance of your church board and accountability. If you don't raise people who understand your ways and they only understand your works, the day that you leave, there will not be generational continuity in that which God has called you to do. And God has called us not to do things that end with us, but things that we pass on to the next generation. Things that we pass on as a blessing to those who come to work in that organization after us. They must find policies that are better than when we went in. They must find a balance sheet that is better than when we took over as CEO over that company. They must find an environment that is less racist and less tribal and has less nepotism and less cronyism than when we kingdom citizens went in there. We must therefore have a mindset that is both watching and is open and willing to step up and be counted. Can I hear an amen wherever you are? Praise God. The other bait of security, the bait of convenience, is peace. If one thing has become clear over this pandemic is how quickly men and women across the world are willing to surrender their liberties when they are assured or promised a certain level of peace and order. All you have to do is say that there is chaos and the reason for the chaos is this. And everyone has demonstrated that we are willing to do anything to be at peace. There is a danger in certain patterns being set. I am not saying that the science is wrong. I myself am a public health specialist and I, I understand the importance of managing co uh, communicable diseases. I fully understand that. But I have also noticed the uncanny tendency and pattern of inconsistent application of public health principles. And realize that it is not only the principles. It is the person applying the principles that also matters. And this is a truth that we must become awake to 
as a, as a kingdom body across the various continents in the world that we are living in today. Listen to me, man or woman of God. It doesn't matter. I didn't say preacher. You can be a man or woman of God without necessarily being a fivefold minister or a pastor or an evangelist or a preacher. By going by the word of God, you are the man of God. First Chronicles chapter 13. He says, and the man of God went by the word of God. So if you are determined, if you are passionate to go by the word of God, listen to me. I am giving you a news flash. You are a man of God. You are a woman of God. Pursue. God will perfect you as you go. You don't get perfect before you become a man of God. You develop a resolve that the standard is the kingdom constitution. Once you develop that resolve and you submit to it, then you will be transformed from one level of glory to another in the course of your journey. And once that is your disposition, and you are a man or woman of God, whether you're in the marketplace or in the, the, the sphere that we call fivefold ministry, or in church, or in a parachurch organization, you must be awake to the reality that God is counting on you to excel and get to the place where you will be the individual behind policies, behind the enactment of rules, behind the enactment of policies in the land, be behind the execution of uh, regulations. We cannot sit idly by and hide only in the prayer closet. Because listen to me, friends, that which happens in the prayer closet needed someone to execute it in the name of Cyrus. The faith that the children of Israel had needed someone to stand up in the valley of Sinai and say, even if we burn, we shall not bow. Someone needed to embody that faith, embody and take a position so that there is an entrance of the principles of the kingdom into that sphere where there was a danger for the lives of men and women that they would be subdued and subjugated to a different kingdom. You must therefore be willing, you must therefore be willing to stand up and be counted. To stand up and be counted. In the 21st century, mark my words, I tell you for sure, in the 21st century, there will be a greater need and demand for men and women to stand up and be counted. The safety of being a Christian in the four walls of a church or being on fire when you are the preacher and you have the microphone and no one is holding you accountable, no one is challenging your faith, I tell you for sure, those days are numbered and they're expiring. You must be able to give an account of the things that you believe and back it with your life, back it with your understanding and build your life and career in a way that it is in tandem with that which you profess. For that is the kind of need and integrity of the 21st century. Listen to me. That's the reason for this kingdom church meetings, the training sessions that we are holding, is not, we are not trying to replace Sunday service where we are able to teach you about the importance of faithfulness, the importance of forgiveness, the importance of, um, you know, uh, coming to church and, and fellowshipping on a daily basis and evangelizing. These are critical things. The ability for you to come together and worship and be edified with brethren on, you know, in, in a real tangible way, in agreeing, touching and agreeing on your needs. The Kingdom Charge platform is not replacing that. This is meant to raise a new generation of kingdom men and women and put a fire in your belly that whether you are called to the fivefold ministry or you have been called to the marketplace in the arts and entertainment in, in media in the business sector in academia in governance in the family front it doesn't matter where you have been called to 
You have an anointing that is a kingly and a priestly anointing. And in the 21st century, we will not be able to make the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God unless we take the anointing of the sanctuary into the marketplace. Until we take the same action and sense of urgency of the revivalist into the one who is the cashier in that bank, who is the, the salesman in that car showroom, who is the CEO in that, in that uh, major, major business venture, the, five, uh, the, the Forbes 500 uh, business uh, venture. We must be able to take that same kind of understanding and grace and wisdom and unction and power into these realms. It is not enough. For you to, to say, I am an engineer, therefore my life is at peace. Listen, one day the enemy is going to plant a wicked boss over you. And he is going to hound you out with all your papers and your integrity. And your good will be spoken of as evil. They'll set you up like they tried setting up Daniel. And if you don't know how to pray for yourself, if you don't know how to get on your knees and call a brother or sister who knows how to call heaven to run, on your behalf and close the mouth of lions. Those were not spiritual lions. Those were natural lions. And the, the, the fact that they were natural was experienced the morning when Daniel got out and those who were scheming against him went down. The lions did not even wait for them to reach the bottom. Basically, it means that the lions tried jumping up so that they would catch them before they hit the ground. There are lions that the enemy may send your way, my brother, my sister. Don't let your career give you the illusion of peace and allow yourself to despise the importance of sending root downwards as a kingdom citizen so that you may bring forth fruit upwards. Salaries and paychecks quit sometimes. Business occasionally has a bad season. So you must understand kingdom economics. Don't allow the convenience of a peaceful season to make you surrender the truth that comes and the freedom that comes from walking according to scriptural principles. When you have become a man or woman who is competent, who is diligent, who is hardworking, even if they kick you off the job, it's not the end of life. You will go right down the road and get another job because you know who you are. You know your substance. You know your stuff. If you're a musician and you have not been slipping your way around the music industry, oh, what did I say? Oh, yeah, 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 that's exactly what I mean. Because there are strongholds and strong men that seek to defile you because there is a certain close proximity between the music ministry and the prophetic and the ability to bring liberty. And if it can be defiled, then a ceiling has been put on it. If you can't just determine that I will allow God to raise me and lift me in my season and I will not compromise because of the urgency to compete with others, you will find that God is going to bring you to a place where you will not only have ministry, but you will have integrity and authority. There are men and women who will respect you, not just because of your talent and your gifting, but because of who they know you to be. They will allow people to come into your life and sit under your tutelage because you have established a track record as a man of God, as a woman of God, as a boss, as a worker, as a businessman, as an academic. In that university, you have established a track record because you have avoided the convenience of cronyism that gives you peace that you don't deserve. The fourth one, the third one, sorry and then we, we will wind up for today, is acceptance. The desire of the 21st century believer not to be misunderstood and not to be mocked. Scoffers and mockers are, are given in the day we are living. The media will mock. The ignorant will mock. The jealous will mock you when you're trying to build something for the kingdom. The arrogant will mock you. 
the insecure will scoff at you. Those with hidden agendas will scoff at the wall you're trying to build around your family, around your generation, around your ministry, around your associations. When you start setting parameters and boundaries around how you are going to relate with people, those who do not want you to have boundaries so that they have unfettered access without qualifying and earning that access into your life, they will mock and scoff at you for having set boundaries when you don't invite them to your house so that they can snoop around and gossip about you and plan how to sabotage you and get jealous about how your house is turning out, how your family is at peace, how things are working out for you. If you don't have the understanding that in the day we are living in, mockers and scoffers are actually a staple of the 21st century existence. Decently dressed in suits and Armani dresses. Designer dresses and watches. And yet they are mockers and scoffers. Men and women with great titles and resources. And yet they are mockers and scoffers. And if in your heart the one parameter you have of success, of being blessed, is being accepted by everyone, you will have to sell your birthright for a pot of red bean steel. Because some of the people that you are trying to, to court their acceptance, when you truly understand what is behind them, who they are, how they became, who they became, then you yourself may not even want to be associated with them. When you understand the broken lives that have marked the pathway to them being where they are today, they are talking nice, but remember, there are men and women, families that have been dispossessed for them to get there. There are men who are dead right now. There are sons who don't have a father because of that man that you are aping and running after their acceptance. That woman who is trying to pattern themselves as a model of what is ideal and they didn't have the patience to stick in in a certain situation and they completely scuttled what could have been a great business. Listen to me, friends. Acceptance needs to be from those who are kingdom-ordained and considered worthy. There are some members, I dare say today, that the only way you will get their acceptance is if you submit to their principles of life. Their contention with you is not really about any particular thing. It is that you are not submitted to them. And they will contend and contest and gripe and complain and mama and scandalize you until the day that you go and sit under their feet. Then they will accept and allow you to be okay. I remember some preachers of old and said that if you are going in any direction and you have not met the devil, then you are probably walking hand in hand with him. Oh my goodness, I know the principle of what it means is that if you're going upstream, if you're going counterculture, if you're going across and against the grain, there must come a time when you will find a season of difficulty, a season of challenge. That doesn't mean that you just go around looking for rejection. That doesn't mean that you, you develop poor communication skills and have low, you know, poor character and then you get rejected because of that, and you say it's because of the kingdom. No, no, no. Listen to what I'm saying. Is that having done all things, you must aspire to have acceptance number one of your king. You must desire that the most important thing that you need to hear by the time you're done is well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not well done, that thou famous servant. Not well done, thou rich servant. Not well done, thou, well done thou, thou highly acclaimed servant. No, it is well done, thou good and faithful servant. If your king can say you are both good and faithful, that is the acceptance that you must seek beyond everything. The rest is a bonus. If brothers and sisters accept you and love you, we thank God for that. 
Because the pleasure of fellowship is wonderful. But you don't live your life seeking primarily the acceptance of men. But when you are aligned with the king, those who are aligned with the king will discover that you are their kindred. And they will accept you. They will give you the right hand of fellowship. They will love you even if you are different from them because they will sense the heart of God in you. They will sense the passion and zeal of the kingdom in you. And because of that, they will be able to identify with you. But if acceptance at all costs becomes your mantra, whether you say it verbally or it is an evidence in your life, Listen to me, my brother, my sister. The environments you will go into where you will take your faith and put it in your back pocket and you make sure that you will go through that environment without anybody having any slight possibility of understanding that you may be a kingdom citizen. You will basically live with a mindset that you will deny the kingdom if it serves your purposes. You must have the right mindset. The convenience of being accepted is not the, all, the, the be all and the final target for kingdom citizens. You must also identify the environment of the people that believe like you so that when you deal with rejection, if it happens in certain spheres, you must have a way of falling back to the right environment where you will have brethren of like precious faith to encourage you. Men and women who believe in you and say, it doesn't matter, go get back into the ring and uh, take, take, take on one more round. Give it one more shot. Stand in one more time. The God who called you is able to deliver you. He's able to bring you through. The one who promised, he's good for his promises. So, this may be a battle that you have lost, but it's not the war. The war is still on. Pick yourself up, dust yourself. Men and women who speak life, who speak Zoe to you, who speak faith, who speak not religious dogma, not men and women who, tell, who judge you every time. Even before you sleep, they're already speaking judgment because in their mind, you have already sinned. They just don't know it yet. No, I'm not talking of those kind of individuals. I'm talking of those who go by the, the scripture and who go by the spirit of God, who bring liberty, who bring faithfulness, who bring joy, who bring hope, who bring peace. Identify such a company of people, whether they be in a congregational setting, whether they be in covenant relationships, whether they be in mentorship relationships. Listen. Don't allow the labels of your denomination, your race, your gender to limit you from getting connected with the men and women that you need to help you walk through this life. Don't allow that limited mindset rob you. That's why you must overcome it. That's why you must raise beyond. You must arise beyond and raise yourself beyond the level of being limited by the same rudiments of the world that separate people and they are feminists and they are pro-men people. They are, they, are, they are those who are overtly against, uh, against Caucasians and they are those who are against the Negroes and those who are against the, the Arabs and they are those who are against the Indians. And you can tell it in the, the slurs they use and the words they use. They are those who despise the young and they are those who dismiss the old. They are those who despise the poor and they are those who... According to them, everyone who is materially blessed is a thief. If you allow yourself to get into that environment, the day you need mentorship in your business to have financial breakthrough, you will limit yourself because there are men and women of integrity who have financial breakthrough. And you will not seek them because you have an attitude. The kingdom citizen in the 21st century must avoid blanket categorization of people and must learn to deal with people individually. You must be a kind of man or woman who escapes the blanket labeling of genders, of races, of tribes, of regions, of groups, age groups. And say the millennials are not dependable. No, 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 no. 
there are as many unreliable uh, baby boomers as there are unreliable millennials in the day that we are living. It's not just a matter and a function of the generation you are born in. It's a function of the kingdom of God functioning inside of you. You must be the kind of man or woman who is not pursuing acceptance at any cost. Because that convenience will make you trade your freedom. Finally, so that we may end today, is the convenience of immediate gratification. Jonah chapter 2 verse 9, the constitution of the kingdom of God in section Jonah, subsection, I article number 9, because there's only one section there. Uh, uh, subsection 2, pardon me, and uh, article number 9. Jonah 2, 9. It says, those who regard worthless idols forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. Those who regard worthless idols forfeit the grace that could have been theirs. You must realize that there is a reason why there is times and seasons. We are not living in eternity where everything happens all at the same time. Human beings experience life sequentially. We experience life in series. You, you get born, you, you're a kid, you go to elementary school, you go to um, you know, middle school or finishing school or high school, you get into college, you, get, you become a young professional, and it goes that way. Things happen in series because we live in time. And until you settle your, um, in your mind the fact that the, ex the series, the experiencing of things in series is not a determination of your final destiny. And that today you can be broke, but it doesn't mean that this declares that at the end of your journey, you shall walk and finish it in poverty and lack. If you don't have the mindset that tells you that those that you see at that point have made their own mistakes. Nobody hasn't made any mistake. If someone tells you that, then my brother, you better scuttle. You better scamper. They're cheating you. They're lying straight to your face. Everybody has made a mistake. Despite their failures and mistakes, they have gotten to a place where they have learned sufficiently, where they are now stable. That stability comes because there is a process that growth brings. If you seek immediate gratification, then you will be robbed of the process that time allows you to have. I have been teaching and speaking on kingdom processing and that it is only the processing that ensures longevity. If you take a five-year-old boy or girl and you buy them a Maserati or a Lamborghini car, it will, take a, it will be a function of time before they are trying to build sand castles in that car. That car will deteriorate, it will uh, depreciate, and they will not benefit from it. Not because the car has a problem, but because they have not yet matured enough to derive the benefit from it. Sometimes because we feel we need something, we assume we are ready for it. And that convenience of being allowed to get something before you are ready for it can shortchange you what the king has in store for you. Listen to me, my friend, with all due humility. I am so glad you have taken time to, to give me this audience. I don't take it for granted. But please listen to me. It doesn't matter where you are today. Until you get tired of the shortcut. Until you get to the point where you say, every time I try to take the easy way out, and get instant gratification, it has costed me. I have paid a price of becoming a certified professional who has no competence. And right now I am dealing, you know, uh, I, I am in this field, I am in engineering, but I have incompetent, negligent suits following me every left, right, and center, being the kind of individual who went and, and schemed on the exam and didn't allow the process of training to actually equip them and give them skills. And they got someone to kind of do the exam for them. Now you have a paper, but every time you get hired, you get fired. 
Because you thought that the reason of going through university was to get a paper instead of understanding that it was for you to learn skills and gain competencies. You may be in that place today and you're already paying a, di a difficult price. Listen to me. It's never too late to get things in order. It's never too late. You need the kind of mindset that says, while I don't need to go back and study again for this career, I am going to start on my own time going through first year material, second year material, third year material, fourth year material. Make sure that I have learned the things that I needed to learn about how to build bridges that don't break after three weeks so that I don't get sued and I don't get wiped out economically so that I'm strong, so that I'm proper, so that I do not end my journey in total shame and total disrepute. You can go back and fix some of those things that you fail to get because you are pursuing instant gratification. You got married before you understood what it is required to be a husband, a wife. And you pay the price for it. That doesn't mean that the rest of your life has to be uh, uh, characterized by that. You started a business. You invested. Everything went down the drain. Consider that to have been school fees in the, in the school of economics and business management. Don't walk around saying that I'm no good in business. Go back, reflect on that, learn the lessons that you should have that you should learn from that. Learn the lessons you should have learned before you went in. Recoup your strength, re uh, recollect yourself, and get back into the ring one more time. Don't let your story end where it is today. My brother, my sister, listen to me. Don't let your story end where it is today. Don't let those who laughed at you have the last, the last laugh. Don't let it happen. Your father in heaven is a God of another chance, not just a second chance, another chance. He is going to help you. He is going to strengthen you. He is going to lift you up. He is going to uphold you according to Isaiah. Fear not, O warm Jacob, for I am with you. God never quit on you. You may have quit on him, but I can tell you, 20 plus years down the line, actually it's not 20 plus, it's 27 years down the line, I can tell you, you can quit on him, but he'll never quit on you. You can lose your mind and act the fool, but he will never lose his mind, nor act the fool. He is a steady pair of hands. And you need to think about connecting and reconnecting with him. Because he is able to make crooked places straight. As we live as kingdom citizens in the 21st century, friends, do not remove the landmarks which the fathers had set. As we get increasing revelation and we use all kinds of learning and knowledge, the landmarks that have been set from time immemorial about the kingdom, friends, don't forget them. They ground you, they secure you, they protect you. Wow, we got, to, we got to finish, we got to finish. This is a good place uh, for us to finish. And uh, when we come, come in uh, two weeks from now, uh, our next session, I will start going into the principles, seven principles for the kingdom citizen in the 21st century society. Seven principles, seven principles. Uh, this, this is going to bless you. This is going to tremendously bless you including the need for you to discover kingdom culture and that your church culture, your natural culture, your racial culture, your traditional, your economic, your socioeconomic groups culture is not necessarily the kingdom culture. So everybody needs to make a change. Everybody. I do, you do. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so th for the honor the opportunity to listen from you. I pray that you will add your grace and your anointing to everyone who has listened to us live today through the various platforms, to those who will listen to this subsequently through the various platforms, whether they're in their cars, in the plane, in the different continents of, uh, of the world, whatever different time zones. Father, I pray let your grace and your anointing come through 
this media to touch them, restore them, allow them to recalibrate who they are and who they have been called to be so that they may become ambassadors who are acceptable before the King Eternal. For those who are backslidden, Lord, I pray, stretch your hand right now and touch them and restore them to their faith. Restore them to the peace with the King Eternal, even Jesus. For those who are dealing with anxiety, with fear, because of the pandemic, worry about how life will turn out, their business has suffered, they have lost their livelihood. Father, I pray today, right now, for supernatural provision. Father, send men and women who will speak life into that environment that looks like it is dead. Bring courage where there is fear. Bring peace where there is turmoil and anxiety, O oh God. Father, open doors, open doors, open doors so that they will be able to testify that when everyone says there's a casting down, we shall say there's a lifting up. I thank you and I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. I thank you, friends. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Patrick, uh, all the way from uh, Mombasa. God bless you. It's always a pleasure to connect with you. And from across the different continents, from India to South America, my friends in the U.S., those in different places uh, within Europe, and of course, from the motherland in Africa, God bless you. Be refreshed. Be sustained. This is Dr. Norbert Rakiro, and I'll see you in two weeks. God bless you. Bye-bye.